Hey there, welcome to the webcast. It's summer, and as temperatures begin to rise, so does the number of trauma-related injuries. Now, back in 2013, we put out a podcast called The Lethal Trauma Triad. And in that podcast, we covered three important factors in trauma resuscitation, those being acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. Research has now shown that there's a fourth component that we need to consider, that being hypocalcemia. Today's webcast is going to take an in-depth look at the previous three components, component therapy, whole blood, and the newest factor, hypocalcemia. Since there are now four components instead of three, let's dive in as Eric Bauer takes us through the new concepts that make up the lethal trauma diamond. Hey everybody, welcome to the Lethal Trauma Diamond. Let's get started. Objectives, we're going to define the Lethal Trauma Diamond. We're going to discuss damage control resuscitation as it pertains to the four components of the Trauma Diamond and analyze a case study throughout this uh, lecture and apply it to core pathophysiology. We all have seen through the evolution of trauma resuscitation the term damage control resuscitation and really that focus was on what was called the lethal trauma triad or the lethal trauma triad of death. And it encompassed three components. Number one, hypothermia, number two, acidosis, and then coagulopathies as a result. But in recent years, there's been a lot of focus on a fourth component. And that's where we're going to get into acidosis, hypothermia, coagulopathy, and a new kid on the block, hypocalcemia. And this is become a really popular area of focus in trauma resuscitation. A lot of great research has been done on this, really from an observational standpoint only. There definitely needs to be a, a really definitive randomized control trial that focuses on this. But I think so far, based on the, the evidence, um, really physicians are pushing for this treatment in the early stages of resuscitation. And so that is where we're going to focus our attention on is what that research says, really what the focus is, and how it applies to our ultimate trauma resuscitation. Let's start off with a case. We have a 28-year-old male, 100 kilos, hit by a car. Uh, you're called to transfer this patient by helicopter to a level one trauma center. Current vitals, when you arrive, you have a blood pressure of 88 over 62, a pulse of 130, and an entitled CO2 of 22. Uh, and we calculate a shock index, and we have a shock index of 1.4. Now, the key here is, is a few little things. Number one, the pulse rate really screams at me. Any pulse rate greater than 120 in trauma is telling you you are already in a decompensated shock, regardless of a hypotensive blood pressure. So you could be normal tensive. Remember, you have to have a class 3 blood loss uh, 
um, over two liters to even have any type of blood pressure drop. That's always a late sign. So this patient now has a drop in pressure. Uh, and tidal CO2 of 22 tells us a few things. Number one, most likely is related to perfusion, uh, but it could be based on a minute ventilation issue. Uh, we have to look at that. And then obviously these patients uh, in a massive hemorrhage situation, and we're assuming there possibly may be a massive hemorrhage in this patient, um, is it an acidosis? And it's unlikely going to be an acidosis to the point of, of compensation. So I would say this is a perfusion-related antidal CO2. The shock index, though, is something that you can use as a tool, and it's very simple. Take the pulse, divide it by the systolic blood pressure. And what I do early in the resuscitation phase is I don't worry about a blood pressure. I will check a radial pulse. If I have a radial pulse, I'm going to use a systolic of 90 as my number. You know, I know that's not a perfect science, and uh, there's some different thoughts on that, but I think it works for me, and it gives me enough of an idea uh, on the standpoint of a shock index that I can make good clinical decisions. So I'm going to just take 130, divide it by that systolic of 88, and we get a 1.4 shock index. Anything that's significant is going to be greater than 0.9. So 0.9 is our, is our threshold. Anything greater than that tells us we have an ominous situation. We have a patient that has a potential decompensation uh, in store for us and future resuscitation efforts. If we continue and look at this patient, physical assessment, secondary assessment, pupils are equal uh, at three millimeters. They are sluggish. There has been airway management that has been taken care of. We have a 7.5 ET tube, good antidotal CO2. Uh, breast sounds, though, are absent on the right, coarse on the left. So we need to look at that a little bit closer. They do have a, a some labs. They have a chemistry panel, an ABG. We have a pH right now of 7.21, CO2 of 47 and a bicarb of 16. We have a PaO2 of 88 and a base excess of negative 9, which would be a base deficit of 9. So at this point, we have an uncompensated metabolic acidosis, uncompensated metabolic acidosis, um, or you could really say a partially compensated. Our CO2 is slightly elevated, um, but that is very borderline. Chemistry, K of 3.6, sodium of 134, um, mag of 1.9, calcium of 1.1 millimoles per liter. And I specifically put millimoles per liter because there's a few different ways to measure calcium. That's going to give you different types of measurements. Really, in, in the context of millimoles per liter, a normal calcium is going to be 2.2 to 2.6 millimoles per liter. So a 1.1 calcium is significantly low. We have a BUN of 14 and a creatinine of 0.8. Let's look at their studies. So first off, look at the pelvis. We have three compartments we really want to focus on. It's our chest, our abdomen, and our pelvis. Patient was hit by a car. We definitely have significant mechanism. And when we look at this, and I have this area highlighted, we definitely have an open book pelvic fracture. So that open book pelvic fracture is significant. Just imagine all the vessels, all the arteries and veins that line and run through the pelvis. And we should also note at the very top of our pelvic girdle there, if we draw a horizontal line, as you can see here, we definitely have a shearing of the left side of the pelvis. So that is significant. That is a significant injury. Any vertical shear pelvic fracture is a life threat. And we know that the patient can bleed out their entire blood volume in just their pelvis. So we have to take care of this. Now, in early resuscitation efforts, if you are working in the field, any multi-systems trauma patient should be treated as having a pelvic fracture, regardless of your assessment ability. If, you know, we don't want to rock the pelvis, you can palpate the pelvis. If the patient is conscious, alert, and able to follow commands, you can have them lift up their legs if a patient can lift up their legs one at a time, they don't have a pelvic fracture. That's the key. So that is a great rule out for differential diagnosis. Have them lift their legs up. If they can't, possibly have a pelvic fracture. Obviously, you're going to look for femur fractures, deformities in those areas. And if you have deformities in those areas, you're not going to have them do that. But in light of not having any visible deformities, any appearance of fractures in the lower parts of the legs,
uh, or the femur, absolutely have them try to lift their leg up. Ultimately, though, we want to always just use caution and put a pelvic binder on every single level one trauma patient. Um, it really could save their life. It's a cheap, uh, very definitive way of stabilizing that pelvis, and, and it is significant in slowing down or stopping that bleeding. Let's look at the chest. If we look at and evaluate this patient from a chest x-ray standpoint, remember from a chest x-ray, any x-ray standpoint, if you're looking at the screen, the left side of the screen is the right side of the patient. And we can definitely see our left lung, which is the right side of the screen for you. Um, you know, we have good air movement throughout. We can see we have, um, you know, good expansion of that chest. We can see the margins. Um, you might have a little bit of a, a, of a pneumothorax that's appearing. And I've, I'll put this line in right here. But based on your assessment, right, we had coarse lung sounds in the left. I would definitely want to reassess that. But on the right lung, remember the right lung has three lobes. You definitely have a diminished or uh, collapsed area. That's probably fluid that you're seeing. And that is encompassing the lower to middle lobe. And so we definitely have to take care of that. So this is likely a hemothorax. We have no lung sounds on that side. That needs to be taken care of. That's a life threat. So based on your ability, you know, this is going to be finger thoracotomy initially, chest tube placement uh, before you leave with this patient. You would not want to leave this patient uh, and transport this patient in this state. Ultimately, it comes down to identifying where that hemorrhage is. And we know that hemorrhage is not always visible. Hemorrhage is going to be hidden. Um, that's where ultrasound guided therapy and looking at Morrison's pouch and looking at your chest and looking for lung sliding uh, really gives you a really great added way of assessing your patient very rapidly in the field. Ultimately, we have to err on the side of caution and utilize our uh, ability to assess our patients from, a, again, the standard ways. What's their skin co color, temperature? How do they appear to you? Use your gut instinct, shock index, pulse rate, and assume the worst. But we have to stop that hemorrhage. we got to get them to definitive care. The key, though, with the triad of death, or now we're calling it the trauma diamond, is there's secondary life-threatening things that happen during our resuscitation that we have to really guard against. The first one is hypothermia. The next one, as I said, the new kid on the block is hypocalcemia. And then we have coagulopathy. Ultimately, we have to understand trauma is the start. Then we get to hemorrhage, and that hemorrhage leads to a shock state. That shock state ends up moving into an acidosis. And because we're losing volume uh, and because of environmental causes, maybe the patient's age adds to this, we become hypothermic, and that leads to coagulopathies. Trauma in itself starts an inflammatory response. We get that surge response. Again, based on that patient's age, do they have underlying medical issues? Are they on medications? Can they compensate normally? And then how are we resuscitating our patients? Resuscitation adds to this. If we're resuscitating with lots of fluids, normal saline, LR, are you diluting this patient? Are you giving this patient cold fluids? So there are so many things that we do, and you could call them atrogenic, meaning we're causing this. Even though we're trying to do no harm, we cause further injury to the patient. So it's all about understanding resuscitation goals, being very definitive in your actions, and following evidence-based practice. We want to stop the bleeding. Again, as I said, we don't always know where that bleeding's at. This is a great example of a Reboa placed in zone number three. We don't have Reboa in the field. Very few areas in the United States have Reboa. Um, hospitals, obviously, level one trauma centers, and Reboa is, is, is widening in, in, in and around the world. But we have to get patients to definitive care to trauma surgeons to where they can uh, 
intervene in advanced ways. The key for us is to make sure we treat our patients according to evidence. One of the things I think back on is in my early days as an EMT, I became then an intermediate and then a paramedic, is trying to achieve a blood pressure that was normal in these trauma patients. And we've learned, obviously, a lot over the last 30 years. But the goal for permissive hypotension is to perfuse the kidneys. That is ultimately our goal, our foundational goal. Now, there's some added thought processes that go in. Do we have a patient with traumatic brain injury? We know that in those patients, we have to maintain a higher MAP. That MAP needs to be at least 90. And that's because we have to maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury. We assume that every patient has an ICP of at least 20. A lot of the literature says 15. I always round it 20. It's easy. Gives me a little bit of a, a cushion there. And so that gives you a good solid 90. But in most patients, blunt penetrating trauma outside of traumatic brain injury, a MAP of 65 should be our goal. That means you could have a hypotensive patient that is less than 100 systolic that is perfusing enough. And really the thought process, guys, is we don't want to pop a clot. Our body is amazing. And even though we're hemorrhaging out, we have this huge immune response. We have our coagula coagulation factors that are flooding those areas that are injured. And we do start clotting very, very quickly. But is our resuscitation causing more harm? And that's where, again, I go back to my early days where we were flooding our patients with volume. And I think we've seen this in recent years in a lot of different areas of medicine. We've seen it in sepsis. We've seen it in burn patients where more is not better. We understand much better now that normal saline, although a good fluid, in high volumes can cause a lot of problems. It definitely potentiates acidosis. It definitely causes more harm in large volumes. And remember, when we're giving patients normal saline, even LR, there's no coagulation factors. There's no clotting factors. And that is going to cause problems. Ultimately, packed red blood cells really was the focus in the last five years. And there's problems with packed red blood cells as well. We know there's a huge citrate load. We know that there's, there's problems. One of the studies that I want to point out that really focused on component therapy and the benefits was done by a lead researcher, John Holcomb, down in the Houston area. And it was really comparing one to one to one versus one to one to two ratio. And as you can see, the conclusion really the benefit was shown in the first 24 hours, but there was no increased survivability at 30 days. But when you compared one to one to one versus one to one to two, again, we're talking about packed blood cells, platelets, plasma, cryo, etc. There was a benefit in that first 24 hours. And then we saw a trial done specifically called the PROMIT trial on FFP. And this was a prospective observational multi-center trial that focused on the effectiveness of treatment with plasma. And really, the conclusion was higher plasma and platelet ratios early in resuscitation were associated with decreased mortality in patients who received transfusions of at least three units of blood products during the first 24 hours after admission. Among survivors at 24 hours, the subsequent risk of death by day 30 was not associated with plasma or platelet ratios. So what we're seeing here is very, very similar to the previous trial that we just looked at, is that it, it's beneficial in the first 24 hours, but it doesn't always translate to 30-day discharge or 30-day survivability. And then we have whole blood, and whole blood has really become a mainstay. Whole blood, we know, is much better. Uh, it's all about supply and demand, though. Uh, and your ability to store this, store this correctly. The key, though, is to look at this from the standpoint of how good in comparison. And I've got this slide for you to compare. 
when you look at whole blood, if you give 500 mils of whole blood, you are giving a hematocrit between 38 and 50%. Your coagulation is 100%. Platelets are excellent at 150 to 400,000. And you're giving one gram of fibrogen. Your citrate load is much lower. When you compare that to component therapy, packed blood cells, FFP, platelets, and cryo, you're giving more volume, 300, 680 mils. Hematocrit, though, is much lower at 29%. Coagulation, 65%, actually much lower. Platelets, only 80,000. You're still giving that fibrogen at one gram, but your citrate load is massive. So ultimately, whole blood is superior uh, in all counts. One of the areas I want to really focus on is a, a trial that was done in the Kentucky area. This is courtesy of Air Methods Kentucky, and I was I was involved to a point, really the lead on this was Kelly Miller. He is currently the VP of clinical services for air methods. Uh, so all thanks to him and air methods. Um, but this was really our push uh, to get blood uh, on the helicopters in the Kentucky area. And really he led this, this charge. And so he partnered with the university of Kentucky to be able to look at these patients from transport all the way through their stay. This was in March of 2016, focusing on adult trauma patients. The flight crew had to have two consecutive blood pressures of 90 systolic or less. And really, when you looked at this, sample size was very, very small. You can see pre-hospital transfusions, 13. Uh, flights without blood were 23. What I want to focus on, though, is the data that was extrapolated from this small study. And really, it was to look at base deficit lactate level, H&H, &H, and was there a significant difference in patients that were transfused? So you can see here over on the right, I have a highlighted mortality um, percentages based on pre-arrival or arrival base deficits. Remember, a base deficit is a, a also a base excess. So for example, if you have a base deficit of seven, as you can see in this area here, that's a negative seven base excess. So notice in this first area, no blood products whatsoever. Arrival base deficit was 7.28. Pre-receiving center blood was 5.01. If air methods transfused the patient, um, 4.45. Seen flight transfused, so this is earlier intervention, 3.3. So that's a big difference. And then seen flights without and so notice that scene flights with 3.3, scene flights without 9.37. If you go over to our mortality chart, that is a mortality greater than 23% in those patients. That's pretty significant. So let's look at another data point. When you look at base deficit from the standpoint of research, a base deficit classification for hypovolemic shock was developed on data of 16,000 patients. And really what they looked at was, did it give a prediction with worsening base deficit injury severity increased in a stepwise uh, pattern from 19.1 in class one to 36.7 in class four. While mortality increased in parallel from 7.4% to 51.5%. So that is huge. So really in conclusion, base deficit was superior to current ATLS classifications of hypovolemic shock in identifying the presence of hypovolemic shock and in risk stratification, patients in need for early blood product transfusion. So the key here, guys, is significant differences were seen in this small little trial in both serial lactate and base deficit in the transfused patients with 64.4% reduction seen with transfused patients. Wow, that's huge. When you look at the arrival H&H, &H, no blood products, we have a 10 and 33. If you look over here at the scene flight transfused, 13 and 40, scene flights without 10 and 31. So that's a big difference. Again, big difference with transfused patients versus non-transfused patients. And ultimately, hemoglobin results reflected a 22% increase in hemoglobin concentrations for transfused patients. Now, is that significant? Is that going to improve overall survivability? 
I don't know. And really what we've seen in previous blood studies is, is there is a, a, a benefit in the first 24 hours, but from a standpoint of 30 day discharge, a lot of times there's so many other variables in play. Um, it doesn't always translate to 30 day discharge with survivability. What about lactate? As you can see, no blood products, lactate of 4.84. When you go over here to the scene flight transfuse, 3.9, and then scene flights without 5.28. And if we go over to our mortality predictor, you know, anything lactate in the 2.4 to 4 range, you have a mortality of 6.4. But boy, once you get above a 4, mortality goes up significantly. And so we know in sepsis, uh, lactate is used in that first hour, probably most beneficial in that first hour uh, to see if you have lactate clearance uh, and what that initial lactate is. But there's a lot of other variables in your treatments, in pharmacology that may change the lactate level um, and, and make it go up or down. So really it's that first initial lactate after that first hour um, that we look at. And it's all about a stress response. Remember, your liver is responsible for glycogen release. That glycogen release is all about uh, ATP production. And that glycogen converts to glucose through glycogenesis. That glucose goes through the process of ATP production, splits off into pyruvate, goes into the Krebs cycle. We have active transport of hydrogen ions uh, with our B vitamins, niacin, riboflavin, into the electron transport chain where we have oxidative phosphorylation that happens and ATP is produced. Well, we know that in a stress response, beta-2 receptors, that is exactly what triggers glycogen release from the liver. If we're stressed, we're in a sympathetic surge like these trauma patients are, or any stress response for that matter, you're definitely going to have increased levels of glycogen release, and that ATP production is going to be in overdrive. Glycolysis is going to happen much, much more often. And the thing we have to remember is lactate is produced in aerobic and anaerobic metabolism both. Lactate is a biofuel that our brain, our heart, our different organs utilize as a fuel source. And so lactate is not a bad thing uh, in our normal amounts. Our body uses it. But it's an indicator of a higher stress load, and that is all based on that sympathetic response. Lactate levels showed a corresponding reduction in transfuse patients of 26%, and that is huge. And then lastly, our trauma scoring. And really, when we look at this from a pre-hospital standpoint, we don't, in the, in the pre-hospital side from the paramedic EMT side, really look at trauma scoring. We obviously look, look at Glasgow Coma Scale. A lot of times, our charting will calculate a revised trauma score. Uh, this is more used in the trauma centers or in nursing. But it, there is a corresponding uh, difference uh, when we look at you know, the trauma score and a mortality benefit. So really, from a standpoint of no blood products, our trauma score was 9.83. When we get into the scene flight transfuse, trauma score was much lower at 6.6, .6, and scene flights without was 8.6. And so again, there was a significant decrease in trauma scoring. We all saw the CRASH-2 study, and we've talked a lot about CRASH-2. I'm sure you're using your TXA, and we know TXA needs to be given in that first three hours of injury. Uh, after injury. And TXA is given in a lot of different situations now. It's given in surgery prophylactically. I know it's reduced transfusions for orthopedic surgeons. Um, it's used in, in a lot of different ER settings. It's used for nosebleeds. I mean, there's so many different areas of medicine that TXA is being used. Um, but the key is, regardless if you're using blood products, you need to be given your TXA and give it early. Ultimately, though, our focus should be on what are the life threats? And so let's start off with our calcium. And when we look at hypocalcemia, obviously uh, it's based on a few things. Massive hemorrhage, we're bleeding it out onto the sidewalk. Dilution from that resuscitative phase using lots of normal saline or LR. And obviously the preservatives that we see in packed red blood cells and even whole blood for that matter uh, will cause a hypocalcemic state. Not only does it cause all those other issues, it destroys or encapsulates, I should say, 2,3-DPG. 2,3-DPG, if you don't remember, is a molecule attached to every red blood cell. And its sole purpose is to receive a signal. Uh, it then communicates with the hemoglobin and offloads oxygen to the tissues that are needing that oxygenation. Well, the citrate encapsulates that 2,3-DPG. 
And it really causes really a left shift on the hemoglobin phenomenon where we are unable to offload oxygen. The affinity for oxygen hemoglobin is super high. Now, remember, we're giving packed blood cells or we're giving whole blood for one reason. That is to increase O2 carrying capacity. And so our hemoglobin is uh, is pulling all these O2 molecules. Our seats at the table are all filled up. But because the 2,3-DPG cannot do its job, we have a, a poor ability to deliver that oxygen to the tissues. So that's just one problem. So giving calcium basically starts unencapsulating that 2,3-DPG. And really, studies have shown it takes 8 to 12 hours before just even half of those are able to be utilized to where you can offload oxygen normally, and maybe up to 24 hours for that to completely unencapsulate and have normal function. Not only that, we've seen in the different trials out there, um, the, the advert trial, specifically Dr. Kerry Sims, showed that um, vasopressin levels were at their lowest based on these massive transfusion protocols. And so what she showed in the advert trial was if you have a patient that has over five units of overall blood product administration, um, they were giving a bolus, a 40-unit bolus of vasopressin, and then following that up with a drip at 0.4 units per minute over 48 hours, and they showed benefit. Now, it didn't change It didn't change. 30-day survivability, but there was benefit, and they saw a, a reduction in overall blood product administration in those patients. One study, Webster et al. noted 55% of trauma patients receiving massive transfusion experienced hypocalcemia. That's huge. A second study showed 97% of trauma patients brought into a UK level one trauma center receiving massive transfusion experienced hypocalcemia. So those are huge, huge numbers. Remember, these studies are all observational, though. We need to see a randomized controlled trial that is focused on this topic. In those patients, nine of the 97%, 71% of those experiencing severe hypocalcemia with ionized calcium of 0 0.90 millimoles per liter. Remember, a normal calcium measured in millimoles per liter is 2.2 to 2.6. So that is significant. And the thing to understand is clotting cascades are dependent on the ionized calcium. One of the studies that we referenced in the previous slide, Webster et al. noted that once patients began to receive blood products, the incidence and severity of hypocalcemia increased significantly. Pre-transfusion ionized calcium levels were 1.11. Again, because they're bleeding out, they're losing that calcium load. But after any amount of blood products administered, 89% were hypocalcemic uh, with a post-transfusion ionized calcium of 0.98 millimoles per liter. Remember, again, normal is 2.2 to 2.6. So that, again, is significant. So how do we treat these patients? Well, really, the evidence, again, when we look at evidence, the highest level evidence is a meta-analysis based on multiple randomized controlled trials. The next step down from that are standard RCTs, randomized controlled trials. The evidence that we're seeing here with the trauma diamond and the hypocalcemia and treating that is observational only and expert opinion based on different physicians around the world. And really, the, the, the I think, consensus is this. One amp of calcium chloride after that first unit of blood product. Now, remember, calcium chloride can cause major issues if you infiltrate. So always make sure you have a good large bore patent IV. A lot of physicians out there I know really push saying any calcium chloride administration needs to be through a central line, but we don't always have that capability. And so some EMS agencies have gone to calcium gluconate. If you have calcium gluconate on your rigs uh, or your helicopters, it's three amps of calcium gluconate to one amp of calcium chloride. So you would give three amps of gluconate after that first unit of blood product. And really then when you get into the secondary calcium administration, it comes down to time. How much time do you have here with your patient? Are you in a situation where you have long transport times? We teach all over the world and, and I meet people that have five minute transport times. I have crews in Alaska in the areas of Colorado that have two hour, three hour transport times. And so it all is going to be based on where you're at, but really secondary calcium given after the second 
or fourth unit. Again, the opinions on when to give that second amp of calcium is really varying. Some say after the second unit, some say after the fourth unit. Ultimately, your medical director needs to make the decision, and it's going to come down to how much time you have with your patient. Ultimately, if you have the ability to do point-of-care testing at the bedside, do you have an ISTAT uh, with you that you can do these ionized calcium tests? Uh, the treatment should be to maintain ionized calcium levels greater than 1.20. So anytime you have that drop below the 1.20 millimoles per liter, you need to be treating with more calcium. Again, as I said, one amp of calcium chloride is equal to three amps of calcium gluconate. How do we focus our attention on correct treatment for trauma patients? And what I mean by that is I see this mistake constantly. We forget that our patients are potentially cold. Even if ambient temperatures are super hot, you're sweating. Doesn't mean your patient is not ice cold. It comes down to understanding what's the age of your patient. Remember, pediatrics, elderly patients have a very poor ability to regulate their temperature. They have a, a non-regulatory hypothalamus at this point. So don't rely on specifically the time of year. Every patient should be deemed cold, every one of them. On the aircraft, you should have your full winter blanket on every trauma patient, uh, and that's the key. And really, the greatest contributor to hypothermia is room temperature uh, and fluid administration. Are you warming your fluid? Are you putting your fluid in those fluid warmers even in the summertime. What about winter areas? I mean, areas that up in the north, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Alaska, Canada, that get negative 40, 50 degrees. Um, you need to make sure you have fluid warmers. Are you putting cold blood in or are you do, using some type of warming device that, that flash heats that blood or that fluid before putting it in? That is so big in resuscitation relative to that trauma diamond. Is your trauma bay warmed up? Well, yeah, most level one trauma centers that I've been to are warmed up, but I have seen over and over and over patients with their clothes completely stripped off naked and they're laying there for the world to see. They're not covered up. Everybody's around them uh, and they're ice cold. So we have to really be careful. And we, we see this out in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, get your ambulance warmed up. Understand, even if you're hot, your patient is laying on possibly on a long spine board, they're going to be ice cold, and their ability to regulate their temperature at that point is going to be depleted. This is a great example of the military doing a great job, and I think we've seen that in the Iraq conflict where soldiers were delivered constantly to these battle hospitals, even with ambient temperatures 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, um, hypothermic, because we assume the ambient temperature being that warm that nobody could get cold. And so that's the key. We've learned so much from those military conflicts. Ultimately, we got to maintain normal thermia as best we can, and that requires ATP. And so we have to remember that we're already in a shock state. We're already in a, a severe sympathetic response. These patients are fighting for their lives. If you then put them into a state where they're shivering, they're now burning through more glycogen stores, they have to have those glycogen stores to produce ATP, and you're just causing a shock state, which is going to potentiate anaerobic respiration, which is going to potentiate more acidemia, and that is another key ingredient to that trauma diamond. Ultimately, our delivery of oxygen, this formula here at the bottom, DO2, the delivery of oxygen every minute, is equal to the content of oxygen in our arterial blood, CaO2, times Q. Q is our cardiac output. So we've got to be able to deliver it with a correct minute ventilation. We have to make sure we're optimizing that oxygenation phase. We also have to understand that the perfusion side has to be taken care of. And that's where we always come back to the foundation, the shock state. Are you fixing the shock state? You take one area at a time. Take care of airway, breathing, then focus on circulation and make sure you're optimizing each part of that. But don't forget the small little things of maintaining that normal thermia, maintaining a patient in a state to where they're warm. And that really will add to your ability to 
turn around a negative shock state. What about our coagulopathies? Coagulopathies are huge. We're already starting. We're, we're bleeding out. We're hemorrhaging. We're, we're losing all those clotting factors. We're then diluting our clotting factors. We're becoming hypocalcemic, which is inhibiting our coagulation factors. And so the key is, is getting in front of it. And it comes down to stopping the bleeding, getting in front of the acidemia. Look at this. A pH drop from 7.4, which is normal, to 7.0 decreases our coagulation cascade effectiveness by 70% at the maximum. That is massive. So again, it comes back to early recognition, airway management, optimizing oxygenation, really getting in front of sedation and pain management um, and, and getting in front of those areas that we can control, keeping them warm, keeping them quiet, keeping them still, stopping that hemorrhage and getting them to definitive care. Remember, calcium helps activate coagulation factors in the clotting cascade. Can't forget that. It's also temperature dependent. And it causes that platelet sequestrian, right? We want all those platelets to come together. We want that platelet mesh to happen. But having a hypothermic patient, having a patient that's already hypocalcemic, uh, causes this to stop or slow down. Ultimately, guys, in summary, we have to stop the bleeding. We have to recognize those three life threat areas, our chest, our abdomen, our pelvis. Do the little things, put pelvic binders on, listen to lung sounds, understand mechanism, understand permissive hypotension. A MAP of 65 is all we need. Level one trauma centers all over the country are actually treating patients with blunt or penetrating trauma outside of traumatic brain injury at MAPs as low as 50 just to get them to the OR so they don't pop those clots, so they don't worsen that bleeding or that hemorrhage. Volume replacement, if possible, should start with whole blood packed blood cells. Obviously, component therapy of, of the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one is optimal. Most pre-hospital providers will have packed blood cells or FFP if you're carrying uh, component therapy. And a lot now are going to that whole blood. If you don't have that capability, just remember, you don't have to slam liter and liter of fluid in these patients. Sometimes it's best to just limit that. Focus on a MAP of 65. Don't look at the blood pressure from any other standpoint, even if your systolic is less than 100. Uh, as long as that MAP is 60-65, um, I am golden. Heat loss drives the triad. Can't forget that. That's something that's very easily taken care of. Warm your patients. Warm your fluids. Make sure your blood products are pre-warmed before you put it in. And then remember the new kid on the block, that we have to replace that calcium. And really, I've been pushing this on podcasts for quite a few years. In a trauma setting, in a patient that is in a shock state, their blood pressure is hypotensive, heart rate is up, shock index is up, it is always a good thing to give an ampicalcium. Uh, you're never wrong to go that route. I think it optimizes that cardiac uh, contractility, obviously muscle contraction, vascular tone improves, and blood pressures will potentially improve as well. If you have any questions on this, uh, please email me at eric.bauer at flatbridgehead.com, and I will talk to you soon. Again, thank you so much for joining us today for the webcast. We wanted to make one final announcement uh, that we're really proud of. On June 29th, 2022, we will be launching a brand new website and learning management system. This is a completely redesigned, rethought out experience uh, that's going to be better for you. So we hope that you'll join us on June the 29th, 2022, as we launch our brand new website and LMS at flightbridgehead.com. As always, don't forget to scan the QR code with your phone so that you can claim your one free CE hour uh, having participated in today's webcast. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again next month.